Okay, so welcome to part two of this video on the standard normal distribution, and we're in the process of trying to work out this integral, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 uh, dx. And uh, this is not an easy problem. Uh, what, uh, if you want a picture, we've got like a bell-shaped curve here, and we're trying to work out what the area underneath the curve is. Well, because it's symmetric, the first thing we can say is that it's just equal to 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 dx, because the area of one half of it is uh, absolutely the same as the area of the other half. So the area of the whole thing uh, is uh, equal to uh, 2 times the area over half of it. Now, uh, this is the way I think that is best uh, to view how uh, to do this calculation. If you imagine uh, taking this curve here, the problem that we can, the reason, wouldn't it be lovely? Uh, what, let's have a think about what we can integrate, and then I'll show you what we're gonna do with this curve over here. So, if what we can integrate, it would be absolutely easy to integrate if we had something like x e to the negative x squared over two dx uh, between zero and infinity. Why would that be so easy to integrate? Because um, this is this has a very simple antiderivative. Because if I look at e to the negative x squared two and I differentiate that with respect to x, uh, then what is it going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to e to the negative x squared over two times the derivative of the thing inside, which would be equal to negative x. Uh, so uh, negative x e to the negative x squared over two. So the antiderivative of x e to the negative x squared over 2, if you want the antiderivative of this, it would be equal to negative e to the negative x squared over 2. You just need to put a negative sign there to cancel this negative sign here, because if I put a negative sign there, I'd have a negative sign here, and then I'd have another negative sign here, which would make a positive sign overall. Uh, so that would be the antiderivative. So then we could just apply the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so how could I get this x here? Well, there's a very clever trick for doing that. Uh, if you think about this curve here, now imagine revolving it around. So we start off with this curve like this, uh, from 0 to infinity. Imagine revolving it round and taking uh, the area under the revolved surface. So you will end up with something that looks kind of like this. So you've revolved it round in every single direction, and you want to... So you've almost like got a multi, oh well, that's exactly what you've got. You've got a multi-dimensional normal distribution. Uh, so instead of a hill, it's like more like a mole hill now, uh, sticking out from the ground. Uh, so instead of just being a cross-sectional mole hill, it's now a three-dimensional mole hill. Okay, and how, why would make it t working out the e the um, well working out the volume underneath that be easier than working out the area underneath this? The reason is that if we want to work out the area uh, the volume under this, what we can do is because of the symmetry of it, because we've revolved it round, uh, we could uh, we could think of taking a tiny little interval dx, and we could think about revolving that around three dimensions. And basically, if we add up all the, along from 0 to infinity, all of these dx's, uh, and we revolve them round like this, so I want to draw another picture to try and make it clear. So if we look from above, what we have is we have, um, we're looking like down from here now, from the top, uh, then here is our original, here is our, where our original distribution was. So if we look at back up here, if we imagine this bit, it was originally along from 0 to infinity. Now what we've done is we basically said reflect it, rotate it round, and just um, just make the surface that you make from rotating this around like that. Okay, so if I take any little interval dx in here, then I can make a little circle like this all the way around, like that. A little annulus, actually, sorry, a little annulus. And basically, I can add up the volume uh, the volume under the surface for this annulus, which is going to be uh, what's going to be dx uh, to approximately, uh, because really, if we wanted to work this out, what we'd have to do is, uh, if we wanted to work out firstly the area of this annulus, what we'd have to do is take the area of the bigger circle minus the area of the little circle. But if dx gets really, really tiny, uh, you can approximate the area of this annulus by uh, the length of the smaller circle 
times the uh, times the width of the annulus. So dx is the width of the annulus times the area of the smaller of the smaller circle. Now this is going to be the point x here. So this is the point x here. So the air, the um, length of that inner circle is times two pi x. Uh, okay. And so that's the area of this annulus. Now, if we think about uh, that being part of this surface, if we want the volume underneath the surface, it's the area of the annulus times the height of the annulus. So if you think about it like this, um, we've got this annulus like this, uh, coming down like there, and then we need to go up, and it's got like that. So we've got this, surf this portion of this annulus, and we've got another one inside. Uh, which comes up like that, and it's an awful picture. Uh, but basically, what you've got is like um, a small, really thin cylinder. Uh, so I've got a little sort of pen pot. Uh, it's something like this. And uh, so this is the thickness dx here, and it goes up to a height, which is f of x. And basically, if you add up all of these all of the volumes of this annulus, as the annulus goes out, the annulus, as you go along from zero to infinity, you will get an annulus of a different size. And if you work out the volume for each of the annuli, uh, for each of these annuli, uh, then add them all up, you'll get the volume over, under this overall surface. So basically, what I'm saying is split the volume of this surface up into uh, the volume of each of the annuli. So make an annulus a small annulus at each point of each radius and work out the volume underneath that and then add them all up. So, this is the area of the annulus. If I want to make it the volume of the annulus because it's going up to, you know, some value f of x here, uh, then I just need to times that by f of x. And then what I need to do is integrate this from zero to infinity so that I get annuli of every single possible radii, radius. So I need to integrate from zero to infinity dx 2 pi x times f of x, and that will give me uh, the area and uh, the volume rather underneath this uh, underneath this three dimensional version of the normal distribution. Okay, uh, so then what I will get is uh, if I replace f of x with what it was originally, which is e to the negative x squared over two times 2 pi x dx from zero to infinity. Now that's excellent now uh, because. Uh, and because if you think about this, I've got now this x here, which allows me to integrate it. Uh, so I can pull out the 2 pi, the 2 pi, and then I got the integral of x e to the negative x squared over 2 at dx between 0 and infinity. Now, I know the antiderivative of x e to the negative x squared over 2 uh, because I worked this out prior. It's negative e to the negative x squared over 2. So this is going to be equal to 2 pi uh, times... Uh, sorry, not zero. E, e negative e to the negative x squared over two uh, between zero and infinity. Now, if I put in infinity into there, that goes to zero. If I put zero in here, it goes to one. So if I take, well, I'll write it out. Okay, uh, so I'm going to need some more paper. So if we go down onto our next sheet of paper. Okay, uh, so uh, the limit, uh, so really this is equal to two pi times uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of e to the negative n squared over 2 uh, minus uh, e to the negative 0, which is 1, so minus 1. Okay, uh, so, oh, but there was a minus sign here, so that's what I've got wrong. So there's a minus there, and this would be minus 1, because there's a minus there. I didn't show that very effectively. There should be a minus here. So we get minus uh, the limit as n approaches infinity of e to the negative n squared over 2, and then we get minus e uh, minus e to the negative 0 squared over 2, which is just 1, so we get minus minus 1. Now, this limit is 0, because as n goes to infinity, this goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So, this overall is equal to 2 pi. So, the volume under this, under this three-dimensional, uh, under this molehill uh, analogue of the normal distribution is equal to 2 pi. And the way I just want to recap, the way that we worked that out is we said, uh, imagine taking a dx, uh, go to each, go to every point along zero to infinity. Uh, that's a radius of this perfectly symmetric, um, perfectly symmetric um, normal distribution in two dimensions, rather uh, surface normal distribution. And um, if we want to work out the volume under that, we can consider it a um, surface of revolution. And uh, basically, we just need to work out 
the area over here and times it by the length of the annulus, which is uh, 2 pi x, because we're at radius x. And uh, that will, if we add all of that up from 0 to infinity, we'll get overall the volume underneath the, uh, underneath the uh, two-dimensional surface normal distribution. Okay, uh, so we overall get that that is equal to 2 pi. But now we need to think, what is the area uh, of another way of calculating the area under this under this molehill normal distribution? So if we have it a cross section of it, it just looks like that. And if we come out this way, it looks like this, and it goes down like that on that side as well. So we have a uh, surface normal distribution like that. Well, if we look in the cross section, if we look, if we imagine getting rid of the y-axis for a moment, uh, this looks like e to the negative x squared over two, uh, as far as this is concerned. Now, um, if we think about what uh, what this um, what this area actually is, uh, then if we think about another, if we think about what this function would actually be, it would be it needs to have the same value as uh, this. Okay, I, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this. Okay, so if you go, if you have any point, if you have any point in the plane. So uh, let's call this x and this y. Take any point in this plane with a fixed radius. So let's call this the circle of fixed radius r. Then the value of the of the function, the value of let's call this f, the value of f of this point here, let's call this point x and y. The value of f of x y is the same as uh, the value of f. Um, it's the same as the value here, basically, because the value of the function, the function is perfectly sy radially symmetric. So the value of the function here is the same as the value of the function here, but we know what the value of the function there is. So it's the value or uh, it's the function evaluated at uh, the same radius as this. Now, what is the radius of that? It's the square root of x squared plus y squared. And then uh, evaluated at zero. Well, the y component will now be zero. So the x component is going to have be the radius of this uh, of this uh, point x y, and the y component is going to be zero. So the value of the function is um, the, uh, at any point x y is the same as the value of the function at um, at the at the point that has y component zero, uh, but its x component is the radi is the radial distance of the point x y from the origin. Goodness, that was a mouthful. Um, so basically, we can now just plug that in because we know what this value is here. It's going to be equal to so e to the negative. Now we just plug in this value here. We put in x squared plus y squared squared over two because that's the value of the function. If you're if you are or if you do have a point along the x x axis, so if we just write this out, it's e to. If we just expand this out rather, uh, the square root is cancelled by the square, so we get e to the negative x squared plus y squared over two. So if we wanted to calculate the area under this integral, it would be the double integral over the entire plane of e to the negative x squared plus y squared over two dx dy. Now, this, uh, if we want to compute this integral, this we can split into an iterated integral. Uh, well, firstly, let's put in the limits. This is between negative infinity and infinity, negative infinity and infinity. So you integrate over the entire plane. But the point is, this function here can split up uh, just using the basic law of exponents. So it's the integral between negative infinity and infinity of the integral between negative infinity and infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 uh, times e to the negative y squared over 2 uh, dx uh, dy. But as far as the integral with respect to x is concerned, e to the negative y squared over 2 is just a constant. So this can be pulled out into the integral between infinity uh, between negative infinity and infinity of e to the negative y squared over 2 of times the integral of between negative infinity and infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx and then we've got the dy but as far as the integral between dy is concerned this is just a constant so this can now this integral that's now here can be pulled out of this integral and what you'll get is that you have the integral between negative infinity and infinity uh, of e to the negative x squared over 2 uh, dx times times 
at the integral between negative infinity and infinity of e to the negative y squared over 2 at dy. Now, these two integrals are exactly the same thing. So if this is equal to the integral between negative infinity and infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 dx squared. And we know that this whole overall thing has to equal 2 pi because we calculated it using our surface of revolution argument. So therefore, we get that the integral between negative infinity and infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 at dx is equal to the square root of 2 pi. Therefore, if we go back to what we were originally trying to calculate, all the way back to here, uh, we were trying to calculate what is the integral of f of x dx. Now, f of x was equal to c e to the negative x squared, which was equal to c times this integral. So, c times 2 pi, the square root of 2 pi, needs to equal 1. Therefore, c, this normalising constant, is 1 over the square root of 2 pi. So overall, uh, we, can now, we are now in a position to write down the overall PDF of the standard normal distribution, which is that uh, little f of x is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the negative x squared over 2. And in the next video, what we'll do is show that this has mean 0, expected value 0, and variance equal to 1.